morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this workshop on uh, the future of broadband regulation, uh, organized by the Institute for Information Policy at Penn State and co-sponsored by the Federal Communications Commission. I'm Jonathan Levy, the FCC's Deputy Chief Economist and Logistics Liaison uh, for today's uh, events. Uh, we're very, very uh, happy to have the opportunity to co-sponsor this workshop in the interest of uh, encouraging research on telecommunications policy issues uh, of interest, not just to the FCC, but to a wider community as well. Um, each sector kind of has its own schedule and rhythm. You probably know that an FCC proceeding, you know, there's usually a notice of proposed rulemaking with 30 to 60 days for comment, and then there's another 30 days for reply comments. And while occasionally that schedule slips a little bit, I think it's fair to say that it's not really aligned with the process of academic research. So, you know, as, as, as a general rule, we can't expect the academic community to spring into action uh, at the issuance of a notice of proposed rulemaking, design and complete uh, uh, a rigorous study uh, in time for the comment deadline. So over the years, and I've been at the FCC for many years, we've always been interested in fostering interaction between the FCC and the academic community. We've done it in various different ways. Occasionally, we're able to directly commission research, uh, but we're always on the lookout for opportunities to, uh, to encourage the academic community or to listen to the academic community's uh, uh, work uh, on issues uh, of interest to the FCC. So that's, uh, that's uh, the context in which we uh, uh, agreed uh, to co-sponsor this workshop. And uh, there's a very interesting schedule, and I'm looking forward to all of the presentations. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll uh, pass, pass it on to Amit Schechter of Penn State. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, Welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming. Um, I'm Amit Schechter, co-director of the uh, Institute for, for Information Policy at Penn State, and my fellow co-director, Krishna Jayakar, is here in the front row, and those of you that will um, move on with us to the uh, meeting itself, we'll see him shepherding the, the uh, events as they start, and our co-director emeritus, Richard Taylor, who I will pass the baton to in a minute, is here as well. And, Thank you, everybody, for coming. I want to thank, uh, first of all, the FCC for hosting this event. Uh, a few words of background. This is the eighth workshop in, a ser in the series of uh, workshops that the IIP has been holding for the past four years. Um, as part of the uh, support for the Journal of Information Policy, which we publish at uh, Penn State, uh, the Journal of Information Policy is the only um, peer-reviewed uh, open access uh, academic journal about information policy. And uh, it's an effort that um, has taken uh, some time to build. And one of the ways that we generate papers for this, uh, for this journal is through these, uh, these workshops. Um, we have one workshop that takes place every year in the fall, uh, right before or after uh, the TPRC conference, um, and those those usually take place here in Washington, D.C., and then we have one in the spring, and those are traveling around. Uh, we've had uh, events at uh, Fordham University in New York, at Columbia University in New York, um, at Penn in Philadelphia, and this year we've arrived here, and we're very grateful for the commission's uh, um, uh, hospitality and and for agreeing to to share this to share this place uh, the place with us um, we think it's a precedent sent setting event um, the idea of the journal uh, was to try and bridge that gap that Jonathan was talking about the gap between policymakers and academics um, academic research takes a long time um, and academic journals take a long time to review them and then to publish them and we wanted to provide something that was faster because policymakers uh, want um, yesterday the answer to the question that they will ask tomorrow. And that's not exactly the pace that we work in uh, in academia. So I don't think we've beat that pace, uh, but uh, we've been as fast as getting papers published six weeks after they were 
uh, delivered and reviewed and revised and resubmitted. So that's our that's our uh, um, record. But we've had others that took took longer as well. Um, this is also an opportunity to thank our sponsors. Um, this uh, this event and our whole um, project would not have been possible without the help of the Ford Foundation uh, that has been uh, supporting us for, for the past four years and uh, the help of the Media Democracy Fund uh, that has been uh, supporting us as well. And um, also we are being supported by the um, uh, Office for Information Technology Services at Penn State and by the College of Communications at Penn State. Uh, that is where we're, we are housed and that provides us uh, everyday support for our, for our project. Um, at this point, um, I will pass the baton to Richard Taylor, the co-director emeritus of the and the founder of the Institute for Information Policy and co-editor of the journal. And the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Amit. Uh, obviously, I echo uh, his thanks. Um, the At last year's telecommunications policy research conference, Irene Wu made a presentation about the research interests of the FCC and in, at least in, in principle, this is a, a continuation of that theme of bringing together both the research interests and the data access availability to scholars uh, that uh, can be uh, connected with the commission. And so we're very fortunate to have uh, three of the senior staff of the commission speak to us on, on, on generally on that uh, topic. Uh, and in the interest of time, we're going to sort of keep the introductions brief and, and uh, move along. But we're going to start with Tim Brennan, the FCC's chief economist, uh, moving on to Henning schultz the, uh, the chief technologist, and John Chambers of uh, uh, batting cleanup uh, as the uh, Office of Strategic Planning Chief of Staff. And so um, that may be a little bit succinct, but uh, to keep us moving along without further ado, uh, uh, Tim, we pass it down to you. Thanks very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I need to thank John uh, and IIP. I'm a total free rider at this, despite what the chief economist title might say about that. So I'm just grateful to be here. Um, I want to start with a disclaimer, which is that nothing I say reflects the views necessarily of anybody at the FCC. And I'll, maybe I'll even apply that disclaimer to myself, depending on how this goes. Uh, but, um, but that's probably because of the nature of this position. Um, is that, you know, the chief economist, unlike some of the other positions here, is, a, is a kind of a drop in academic sort of thing. So I tend to think about the question before us today, the future of broadband regulation, more with um, my prior sort of academic hat on and, and what I might be thinking about after I put that academic hat back on in a few months. So, um, so I want to kind of illustrate some of the questions that occurred to me in thinking about this when I was asked to do this. And I want to sort of structure that around three anecdotes, all involving things that happened before I got here. The first of these. Um, in 2005, I was part of a team that, um, that was in Uzbekistan, of all places, to talk about privatization, regulatory policy, antitrust policy, things like that. Um, and in talking with some, with some of the people there about regulation, um, I was talking about Microsoft, and it wasn't too distant a case at the time, I was talking about Microsoft being a monopoly, or at least there were being a lot of indications that it was went during the antitrust case, and, uh, and they rejected the idea. And the reason they rejected it was because it can't be a monopoly because it's not regulated. And the point is, is that just because something's a monopoly doesn't necessarily mean that it's something that you want to regulate. Um, not because you can't imagine a welfare gain out there, but because there's a really serious feasibility problem. How do you know what the costs are? How do you know when something is changing quite rapidly what the product even is? How does one manage that sort of thing? So one of the questions I think about in this, here, in this, in this issue in some sense with about broadband, is broadband more like a water pipe? You know, once you bury it until it leaks, you can forget about it. Or is it more like, say, a computer operating system where you're depending upon some, you know, continuing innovation, um, expansion, things like that to do that? And if it is the latter and you still think it's worth regulating, how do you decide what to do it? What are the prices going to be and so on? So that's the first question that comes to mind. The second question, um, in 2006, I spent a year at the Canadian Competition Bureau. And while I was there, 
one of the big issues before the uh, the Canadian telecom regulator, the CRTC at the time, was whether to, to deregulate local telephone service. In Canada, that's somewhat oddly or ironically, that's actually a federal um, issue, not a provincial one. So uh, uh, as a kind of a competitive advocacy role, the Competition Bureau, sort of Canada's Competition Law Enforcement Agency, um, was involved with this. And the position that it took and ended up being taken, kind of a long, interesting institutional story, which I won't go into, was that was that basically uh, local phone service should be deregulated if there was a second provider out there with the capability of serving most people in a local area, um, and there was no evidence of collusion. You know, that you had an, you had a second active competitor out there, and that was it. And the now why? Well, I mean that sort of speaks to the question or raises the question: Why don't we regulate duopolies? I mean, the, I mean the principle there was sort of was kind of well, regulation is so cumbersome uh, or so difficult or whatever that that you know that any potential competition must be better than regulation. Maybe not any, but any serious potential competition must be better than regulation. Is that right? You know, I mean, I you know, I, I understand the argument, you know, as a kind of a qualitative policy thing, and I'm, I'm and at some level, I'm perfectly willing to believe it. But you know, is you know, does the trade-off always go in that direction? And it's relevant for this because in a lot of places, you might have multiple broadband providers who are going to say, well, is there a future for broadband regulation? What do you do if there's more than one of them? You know, do you just regulate one of them? You pick one? Do you do both of them? How do you do it? That kind of thing. Third anecdote, um, one of my uh, p- positions before coming here, and which I will return to, besides my academic one, is I'm, a, is I'm on the staff of a research institution called Resources for the Future, which does mainly environmental and energy work. And through them, I've done a lot of work on electricity. I've probably been doing a lot more work on electricity than telecom in the last 15 to 20 years or so. And one of the big issues in electricity right now is basically that, that distribution utilities, the people who carry the electricity to, your, to you know, residences and businesses, are sort of up in arms because they think everyone's about to put solar panels on their homes and we're facing all this competition and plus the regulators are making us do energy efficiency, which is reducing demand for our products. What are we supposed to do? And one of the reactions to this in the industry, somewhat understandably, is, well, we need to diversify. We need to get involved in all these things. We need to start providing energy services. We can't be just this this plain vanilla water pipe-like utility. And and one of the arguments that's gotten forgotten, that, that's been forgotten in all of that, that is relevant to the question today is, you know, once upon a time, we actually really cared about vertical integration in regulated industries. And that wasn't just an ivory tower thing. It's why we broke up what we used to call the phone company 30 years ago. It's why in electricity, management of transmission is separated from ownership of generation uh, to, or control of transmission to try to avoid things like discrimination and potentially cross-subsidization. So if we're going to regulate broadband, are we going to bite the vertical integration bullet? Okay, you can provide broadband, but you know, voice over IP looks pretty competitive, so you've got to get out of that business. You know, lots of people can provide streaming video, so okay, no more video. We're going to let competitive markets provide those things. And we're going to start regulating the interfaces between voice, video, and broadband, and perhaps others. Maybe that's easy. But anyhow, those are the three questions I sort of wanted to put on the table among the many others. Um, I apologize. I'm going to be dragged out to a bunch of meetings. Believe me, I'd rather not go to all day today um, or much of the day today. So um, I'm sure if anyone answers these questions, actually, maybe, maybe clarify that. If there's a consensus answer to any of these questions, I'm sure each of you have answers to these questions, but I suspect that they may not all be the same. Um, uh, that if there's a consensus for this, I'm sure John will let me know later. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Henning? Okay. Uh, if I can put up the slides, please. Okay. As probably one of a relatively few uh, engineers, at least by training in, uh, in this room, um, I'm the one which has the token slides. So uh, let me pick up on a theme, and we did not coordinate. I, 
by uh, Tam uh, as well as others in that, namely uh, the issue of speed uh, and scope. So I want to start out by something, again, being uh, a drop-in, uh, to pick up Tim's term, uh, here as what's always struck me, and it maybe is one of those examples of uh, the, the grass is always greener on the other side of the academic divides, uh, namely that there is this perception that technology moves so rapidly uh, and policy is a slow and cumbersome uh, enterprise that moves in decades. Uh, and it always struck me, having been involved on the telecommunication uh, engineering side, that that didn't seem quite right. So let me, uh, in the brevity that this format demands and thus grossly oversimplifying many complicated issues, uh, try to ruminate on that a little bit and maybe say a few things that at least you can disagree with. So I did the easy thing. Uh, I Googled the standards uh, beginning of papers that we tell, at least I tell students, never to use, namely uh, due to rapid advances in technology, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and you get 2.7 million Google hits on that, so it does seem to be a popular cliche. Rapid advances in policy, uh, maybe that changes after today's uh, workshop. <laughs> I well, got five hits and three of those were spam hits. Uh, <laughs> as to why that is, I leave to your Google exploration. So there's a perception of rapid technology progress. Why is that? And, and in some areas, I believe, undoubtedly it is the case, but it often is set without any great differentiation that uh, technology moves at very different paces uh, in the same universe. So, for example, we don't tend to make a a uh, good habit of distinguishing combination advances where technologies that have matured over many, many years are finally combined into a new product. I'll talk about an obvious example in a minute or two, versus more fundamental advances of science that change our perception, a new material, a new physical property, a new algorithm for that matter in computer science. Often, these advances hit the popular press as if they were fully formed and just emanated. So one day, uh, Facebook didn't exist, and the next, my, the next day, uh, every newspaper, tech reporter, uh, had to write an article about it. It didn't mean that the ideas and the gestation of whether you call it innovation or not, I uh, happened at that same scale. So there is effect and kind of a herd effect, I suspect, where uh, innovation, because everybody latches onto it, and then becomes a, uh, a notion that it happens instantaneously. And, and that's, I believe, the important consideration for our field is it doesn't tend to distinguish what you might call peripheral from core innovation. And I'm using the terms with some d deliberateness in kind of their dual senses, in the sense that there is a sort of, say, a value judgment implied in both of these terms. But it, in our case, I believe it actually reflects also just simply physical location. Indeed, if you look at many of the things that you read in the popular press, where I mean, a whole section, the technology section of the New York Times seems to be essentially about peripheral innovation, uh, namely new apps, new devices, and so on, uh, ignores that our core infrastructure innovation has proceeded by necessity at a much slower pace. Just to take a few examples to kind of ground us, the things that we see as relatively new have been with us for many years. OFDM, uh, the modulation technique, which is kind of a core innovation of LTE, uh, was first in a, appeared in a paper in 1966, and in 1985 it was proposed for mobile. Obviously not a new technology. TCP, in the form that we have it today, not in its predecessor version, uh, was standardized in 1981, uh, and pretty much the, the core spec still works just as it did then. Doxis in 1.1 uh, was in 1997, so again, uh, going on uh, 20 years. 
And Google Fiber, just to take an infrastructure, was first announced in 2010, and I believe the customer numbers are still of the order that they probably could crowd into this room. So we have, and I, I think there is a one discussion that we have, namely, is innovation slowing or not? I don't want to get into that. That's an interesting but different topic. Namely, often that we see the notion that technology moves rapidly as, uh, or that a new technology is just around the corner and we shouldn't bother, worry our little heads about kind of the difficulties of today, uh, is an excuse for inaction. I believe that is true, just to pick up on one of Tim's remarks, in energy policy. It's always one, well, it's too inconvenient to save energy or to make existing systems more efficient, but there's this miracle technology, be it fusion, clean coal, or whatever it happens to be, that's just around the corner. So why bother doing anything today? Because it will be in two years or five years or whatever the perceived period of forgetfulness of the audience is, uh, or when the slides can no longer be found on you know, the web, uh, then the new technology will be there, and fusion obviously is, has a tendency of being 20-year technology wherever you are. We also, and this is a little bit of a, a notion of um, change, is uh, I don't want to go through those, but I do think we now have um, a notion that classical things that non-technologists that kind of do technology policy tend to take for granted are just no longer true or can be assumed. Computing performance, we are likely to reach the end of Moore's Law relatively quickly. If we haven't already, we've had to extend kind of, we had to kind of uh, define Moore's Law down as to what it means in terms of uh, uh, Frequency in terms of process, um, uh, transistor count, whatever it happens to be. Uh, you can't read this, but Marsha Bowdy, the uh, president of ACM, had an interesting article. I think it was the May Journal of CACM, Communication of ACM, that goes into that in much more detail. Communication performance, uh, modern technology pretty much reaches the limits of Shannon's law. It doesn't mean we can't improve communication performance, but uh, just simply making it more efficient is unlikely to be easy. Uh, video compression, uh, it's clear that the efficiency of that is the slope is going down. Uh, if you compare kind of H, the H series of video compression and that. Uh, energy density is one of the key ingredients for mobile technology. Uh, we haven't done much better on lithium ion batteries. And unfortunately, and this heads close to home for many of us, uh, the institutions that we have to do these more fundamental advances, uh, Bell Labs to pick up the old phone system, but I uh, even more downstream that, I mean, with AT&T's demise of its, almost all of its senior researchers, uh, the last carrier lab that had academic pretensions, if you like, or academic ambitions, I should say, uh, it also is no more. Let me look at briefly on that new end systems. I won't go over labor in great detail is to say that indeed technology advances to the extent that they occur are not unpredictable. If you look at the ingredient technology, all of those were essentially combinations of things that had ripened enough to be uh, um, put into a fruit salad, so to say, and to make something tasty. Uh, and you can look at the PC, the laptop, mobile devices, uh, care devices have that tendency. Also, I, one important aspect that I think deserves more attention uh, of the policy community is the long lead time that we don't have in other industries quite as much, namely the standardization delay. There are some other industries that suffer from the same problem. You can't quite probably read the numbers, but these are the average publication delays from an Internet draft, kind of the first stage of Internet standardization to publication uh, measured by uh, a colleague of mine. And and the axis in the middle is uh, 800 days, so we're getting on two and a half years, and the top is uh, 1,500 days, so you get to the point of four years or so. So it is very rare that the standards effort completes in less than two years. Thus, I believe the notion that simply te the, that technology evolves too rapidly for policy, rulemakings, whatever you want to say to keep up, 
I think is far too facile and far too an undifferentiated notion to maintain. In addition, I believe that communication technology for all the evidence that we've seen in the past 30 plus years is actually more stable than any others. It tends to be a core technology, which evolves more uh, slowly. It has lots of dependencies. See our difficulty even after 20 plus years to deploying IP a successor to IPv4. Uh, we're still not making rapid progress on that. There's a lack of a single forcing function across an uh, international industry uh, in that. There's standardization delays, often multiple layers of standardization these days, kind of primary and secondary standardization, let's say IHEF, uh, as the protocol standards in 3GPP. And there's a lot of it's good enough for me, which is the IPv4 problem in that. And in addition, uh, newness is often discouraged because of intellectual property rights issues. On the other hand, I think we can, if we need to, uh, go from a uh, notice of proposed rulemaking to a report and order in less than a year, even though that probably isn't typical either. But it certainly is of a time scale which is very much, can be much slower than from a publication of the OFDM paper to widespread deployment of LTE. So I believe we should look at the much more differentiated notions of time scales in technology evolution as opposed to using that as an excuse for inaction, non-reflection, or simply hoping for that a, a magical technology cure will absolve us from our need uh, to do the hard work here as the policy community. Thank you. Thank you, Henning. John? Uh, thanks very much. and. Uh, I noticed David Rettel has uh, joined us, uh, so uh, let me just uh, uh, welcome David to our house. Uh, David, if uh, you all don't know, is chief counsel on the subcommittee of communications and technology of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, so, so welcome to another chief. Tim's a chief. Henning's a chief. I'm a chief. That's what you get in government. We're all chiefs. No, no, no Indians. <laughs> I thought I'd just uh, spend my few minutes uh, uh, with you uh, bridging a little bit. Uh, so both Tim and Henning come from academic backgrounds. Um, I come from business and government. Uh, I think David and I will sort of be the bridge uh, uh, to David uh, and give you a sense at least from the perspective of one person who uh, who hears from a lot of people uh, what sort of what we hear in government, what's useful to hear in government. So uh, I, you know, my effort here in a few minutes is to, is to provide you a bridge to the, if you're thinking about academic papers and you want to have an influence uh, on government policy, at least what works for me, uh, which uh, you know, may not work for other people. But I, I've been at the FCC a couple of years now. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm the chief of the Office of Strategic Planning, which is a small office at the FCC. It's a, a couple of dozen folks, mostly economists, um, a few lawyers, and one technologist, one engineer, which is Henning. Um, uh, I, Henning's so smart, he, you know, he sort of can be alone in this, although uh, in general probably uh, the FCC could use for, uh, you know, a lot more technologists and a lot fewer lawyers. But at least at OSP, we've got a lot of economists in our shop, so uh, uh, I feel a little bit more at home. Um, I also spent eight years on Capitol Hill a long time ago uh, in my younger days. So in the 10 years I've been in government uh, and in part of the 20 or so years I was in the private sector, uh, I spent a lot of my time listening to people who came in to advocate their positions uh, so, as I say, let me tell you at least what works for me when people come in to lobby me. Um, the thing that doesn't work is pure advocacy, uh, again, at least for me. If, if uh, you know, if by now I don't know what people's positions are based on what their companies are, or, you know, <coughs> then I'm not very good at my job. Uh, uh, I'm not saying people can't come in and tell me what their preferences are, or what's good for their company, or what they think would be good for society, and all the rest. It just doesn't move the needle very much. Uh, 
you know, I mean, I like a good argument as much as anybody, but at the end of the day, it's just argument. Uh, what works for me tends to be three things. Uh, I like ideas. Um, I, uh, and, and, and it's one reason I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to stick around as much as I can today and tomorrow, uh, because the papers uh, look very interesting to me. Uh, I, you know, if I either don't have an idea every day or I don't hear a new I, uh, idea every day, I'm sort of like a, a fat person who misses a meal. I get hungry. So thank you for one thing, for all of you being here, presenting your ideas. Uh, it looks to me like a feast. Uh, the second thing that is more effective, I find, are people who come in with real information, real data. I, mean, I know there's a joke sometimes that, you know, places in government are not data-driven policy-making shops. They're more, you know, policy-driven data-making shops. Um, uh, but I tell you, I, I have found that, that good numbers, good data is, is persuasive. It really does make a difference. Um, and the people who come in without data tend to do less well in their advocacy. Uh, uh, and the more information I found that we have at our disposal, the, you know, at least the better chance we have at making good decisions. Uh, and then the third thing I'd say that works, again, works for me, are stories. Uh, I'd say, you know, it isn't enough to come in with an idea or information if there's not some compelling story behind it. Now, I like to read fiction. I prefer a good story over anything else. Um, but I think storytelling is an important part of trying to persuade other people of your policy point of view. Um, in part because I think, you know, if it's just theory, uh, if it's just theory, then it, 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 it sort of leaves... <coughs> It leaves a piece, uh, at least when you're in a policy-making role, it leaves a piece that's missing, which is how does what you're talking about affect, uh, affect people in communities, uh, affect businesses, affect people uh, uh, who are going to school, who need health care, who need, a, you know, uh, a lot of what the FCC deals with, a lot of what the Hill deals with, has to do with the effect on uh, on people. Uh, you know, I I, uh, I tell this story sometimes. Um, when I worked on Capitol Hill, I worked for a man named Jack Danforth. On the wall of his office uh, was a picture of uh, of an old weather-beaten farmer black and white photograph. You could see the lines on his face. You could see the life written in his face. And underneath the photograph were the words, the boss. Uh, I learned when I was in my 20s working on Capitol Hill um, that I worked for the people in those jobs. We work for the public in these jobs. And so if the advocacy doesn't contain a strong element of how what people are talking about is going to affect the public. Um, it's missing something. Uh, I'd also sort of tangentially think you've, you sort of have to have, uh, you've got to have a theory of how something is actually going to work as well. Again, it's sort of beyond theory, but how you think it practically will work, whatever the idea is. Uh, if, for example, um, you're advocating something that is pro-competitive, I tend to say, but I, I need to understand who that, who that other competitor is. Like, sort of, what's the theory? If, somebody, if, if a policy is going to be pro-competitive, who's going to show up and do that thing that you think is going to happen? Um, I, I, I'll give an example to an earlier stage in my career. When I was on Capitol Hill, we were putting together... Uh, in the early 90s uh, legislation which 
was intended to open up the local loop to competition. Um, uh, it, it, it's legislation that ended up becoming the core of the 96 Telecommunications Act. Um, it wasn't enough, it had seemed to me at the time, to just talk about the elements of opening up the local loop. People have been talking about it for a long time. You needed interconnection, you needed access to poles, ducts, conduits, and rights of way, you needed number portability. There were a series of essential elements. But unless there was somebody that was going to show up and take advantage, then it was still all theory. Now my theory at the time was that it was going to be the cable companies. Uh, I became convinced in the early 1990s that the cable companies were going to show up and provide an alternative to the telephone companies. That's what drove my policy decision making in the early 1990s. So um, I guess I, you know, I, I know there is a, uh, a significant role for pure academic research. Uh, I think what we're trying to do here is find that bridge between the pure academic research and things that affect policy. So um, what I'll be listening for today in part is, is that bridge. How can we take uh, what you all do and make it useful to some of the policy decisions that we have before us? So again, I, one more time, thank you all for being here. I think it's a tremendously important conference for us to host, and uh, I look forward to the next two days. Thank you, John. <clears throat> As John noted, we, we had a new face uh, join the table. Uh, David Riedel, uh, who, uh, as John noted, is chief counsel of the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology uh, of the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Energy and Commerce. Uh, prior to uh, joining the uh, Energy and Commerce staff, he served as director of regulatory affairs at CTIA, the Wireless Association, and International Trade Association of the Wireless Communications Industry. Uh, he received his B.A. in journalism and his B.A. in political science from <clears throat> the Pennsylvania State University, and his JD <clears throat> from the Catholic it catches in my throat once in a while, <laughs> and his JD from the uh, Catholic University of America. Uh, he's a member of the New York and District of Columbia bars, and we are absolutely delighted uh, that he has agreed to join us. He will speak a little bit about what his uh, committee is doing, and uh, has agreed to answer a few questions after that. So, David, take it away. Well, thank you very much, and thanks to the institute for having me here. It's uh, it's been a long time since I was. Uh, answering email at a psu.edu address, but it is a fond uh, four years of my life. So uh, I'm excited to be here and, and joining uh, uh, the Penn State crowd. Uh, as, as we were, were noting along the way, uh, I am not uh, an engineer either, nor am I an academic. So uh, I'm just a plain old policy lawyer. So I have a little bit of a different perspective when it comes to looking at how things are moving forward in the policy arena on broadband. Uh, Chairman Upton and Chairman Walden in December of last year announced that the committee would be working on updating the Communications Act to better reflect the technology of the day. And, and doubling back a little bit to what Henning was saying uh, about rapid advances in technology versus rapid advances in policy, um, I think what has animated the way we've looked at the rapid advances in technology is really the rap rapid advances in technology adoption. Uh, you know, Henning rightly points out that we've seen a lot of technologies that have uh, been solidified, standardized over the years, but adoption is really what has been driving the changes in the way that Americans look at technology and technology policy. Uh, biometrics have been around for a long time, but the average American doesn't know what biometrics is. You tell them, oh, it's that touch ID thing on your iPhone that lets your thumb unlock your phone, and all of a sudden they realize, oh, that's what you're talking about. And so as adoption of these technologies has become more and more rapid, um, it's presented a real policy challenge for the statutes that govern uh, the FCC's regulatory rulemaking, and, and certainly that govern the industry itself. Looking forward, uh, Chairman Upton and Chairman Walden have asked us to take a multi-year approach to this process. So we started earlier this year by issuing white papers. We have now issued three of them. One uh, was a sort of overarching look at the policies that uh, underpin the Communications Act. The second one focused on spectrum policy, which has been an area that the committee has been very active in over the last three and a half years since Chairman Upton took the gavel. Uh, doing a lot of work on incentive auctions and uh, getting the FCC the authorization to move forward on a number of spectrum bands. 
And, uh, and then we're also going to be working very heavily throughout the rest of this year, meeting with stakeholders in the academic, in the consumer space, and in the industry space to try and get a handle on what works and what doesn't in the current Communications Act. Uh, I wanted to double back a little bit to what Tim said earlier uh, and when the way he looked at some of the regulation of broadband. You know, How are you going to regulate it? And one of the things Tim said is, what do you do if there's more than one? Uh, I think the fact that we are there is what has motivated my bosses to take a look at how we address these things. We all talk in this town about technological neutrality, but the reality is when we actually look at broadband from a policy, from a regulatory and from a legislative standpoint, we treat the different media that are used to deliver broadband um, in very different ways. We treat cable networks differently than we treat the R box, differently than we treat CLEX, differently than we treat satellite, than we do mobile and fixed wireless. And as we look at these things, they're not always perfect substitutes for each other, but increasingly consumers are choosing to use them as substitutes for each other. Uh, as I sit here, I have three broadband-enabled wireless devices in front of me, um, which proves that I'm a government employee because I have a separate phone for work than I do for home. Uh, and, and as I use these day-to-day, I find myself relying more on the broadband from my wireless devices than I do on the broadband at my desk. Uh, that wasn't the case just four years ago. And, and the adoption of these technologies has really animated the way we look at how to, to move forward on the, the Communications Act update. We're going to be getting in the weeds. We're going to be getting very far in the weeds. And, and that's just a necessity when you start looking at how to address this in the modern era. Um, when we talked about rapid advances in policy, I, you know, I, I think, thank goodness, policy doesn't advance that rapidly. Um, one of the reasons that we have been so successful in this country in moving adoption of new technologies is that regulatory policy sometimes lags a little behind and the market gets to take over and do its thing. Um, wireless devices, mobile wireless, is one of the fastest adopted technologies ever in the history of the world. And it was an affirmative decision in the early 90s to take, <laughs> to take wireless outside the scope of traditional communications regulation and put it into a separate section of the Communications Act that in large part drove that adoption. Companies could get out and compete with each other and compete in the, uh, in the open marketplace to get consumers to adopt this technology. And ultimately that drove prices down to the point where we are, uh, as Americans, let's be honest, very reliant on our wireless devices. Uh, and so as we look at this, we hope that the policies we put in place on the Hill transcend individual technology decisions, transcend the migration to new technologies that uh, supplant what we've used in the past and give us more value, more uh, speed, and, and more services over those, those uh, systems. Uh, I know we are short on time, and I, I certainly could sit up here and hear myself talk for a lot longer, but I'd much rather take questions if it's all the same to everyone else. I doubt anyone would object to that. It's a public meeting. Uh, feel free, anybody, to ask questions. So, Christopher? He's going to wait for the mic. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, please wait for the mic. <coughs> So I'm fascinated in, in trying to figure out how we can contribute information to the policy community. And I'm fascinated, Jonathan, by something you said, which is back, and we can do this easily because you're looking back at 96, a long time ago by our standards. And, I, and this is a question for anyone. It's just the greatest example comes from you. You said you were convinced it was, the cable was going to enter. Um, and they didn't enter in terms of true copper lines, the way we thought, they've now did VOIP, they did something else. But the interesting question is, to me, could anyone have shown you any facts that would have changed your mind? And if the answer is no, how do people trying to interface with policymakers know when we can contribute something and when we should just let other decision-making criteria run their course? Because what I find is sometimes decisions are done and it doesn't matter what we contribute. And there are times that there seems to be real openness to it. And I think the academic community struggles to figure out when, which case you're in at any given moment. Yeah, so it's a, yeah, it's a great question. Because, uh, again, I, I, I jokingly referred to a comment that a former chief economist of ours used to make about uh, you know, policy-driven data making. Uh, uh, f first, just my specific reference to the lead up to the 96 Act, and I had left the Hill before 96, but uh, my shop 
uh, at the time, which was the Senate Commerce Committee, uh, where I was uh, Republican staff director, uh, had produced a piece of legislation in late 92, early 93, when we introduced it, uh, to do a couple of things to promote competition. The animating idea of what we did was to promote competition in the communications marketplace. One of the pieces of what we uh, produced uh, was taken out of our bill and put in the 1993 Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, the thing that David referred to, uh, which uh, uh, moved mobile services. Uh, um, Actually, we, we specifically said that mobile services, CMRS, would be regulated under two sections of, a uh, couple of sections of Title II, Section 201, 202, and Section 208, uh, but would be free from, generally free from state regulation. Uh, and then the other, the other thing that we proposed doing, which became, again, I think a core of the 96 Act, was uh, a set of essential elements of competition. Now, what I meant was, if all we were doing was theorizing about competition, because for a long, long time, competition to the local loop was not was not evident. And I, you know, we used to hear presentations from all sorts of folks, electric utilities who said they would do whatever, you know, telephone over electric facilities and. Uh, that wireless would someday be a competitor. There were a lot of theories as to what would be a competitor. What I what I meant a few minutes ago was um, it didn't seem enough to me to just theorize that there would be competition to the telephone companies which had a monopoly. After all, what we were doing was we were preempting state laws which prohibited competitors from entering, and we were setting up a framework for new entrants to compete, which included those elements we thought would be necessary to compete, such as the ability of a, of a customer to port their number from one provider to a, a competitor and, and back if, if they wanted. Uh, I, what I meant was if, if, if I, and it wasn't just me, but if I and those of us who were working on this issue didn't think there was going to be anybody who would enter the market, then all we were doing was theory. And, and legislation has a lot less to do with theory than what will practically happen. Uh, and while, again, what David says is true, the evolution of that is we have different technologies that are treated in different ways because of that evolution, and it's never really been brought together. Um, uh, I, all I meant was you need more than just the theory. Now, do you need facts? Absolutely. Do facts change minds? Absolutely. I mean, I, uh, I like to start with, right, I, you know, I prefer to start with facts. Uh, um, but I, uh, I find and again, this is the I, I find that when facts are presented, uh, it does change minds. Um, now, when is it too late to change minds? <laughs> hopefully, now you know. Hopefully, it's never too late to change minds. Um, I, I really, we really put a a heavy premium uh, around here on getting good data. I'll give you sort of. The, the one example of a, of a live thing that's moving through the FCC, which is the modernization of the E-rate program, that is sort of reform of the E-rate program, the program by which schools and libraries apply for and get um, funding for telecommunications and Internet access services. We started this process a year or so ago with very little good hard information as to where there's fiber uh, connecting schools, or which schools, how many schools have internal connections, have Wi-Fi, um, which schools are able to do sort of one device per child kinds of learning. Uh, the process of gathering that data and understanding the landscape has greatly influenced the way we think of that reform today. Uh, and we have a long way to go in better understanding. Uh, so, uh, I, I, you know, we, we in many ways are limited as to the information that we get. We have limitations on how we're able to gather data. We have limitations as normal government. So I, data is, is not only 
sort of a lifeblood for the way we run around here. Uh, I would hope it's always the case that new facts and new information can always change minds. So I don't, I, I don't know if your premise was, you know, we ignore it or we don't pay attention to it. My experience has been information is powerful uh, in policy making. Um, I'd like to chime yeah. in and just add to that, if possible. Chris, uh, you know, uh, one of the things I would add is that generally when we're looking at these issues, um, one plus one doesn't equal two when it comes to competition policy. It's not a cut and dried math formula. Um, and the academic community is generally better at this than most, but when you when you bring facts to us and you bring your conclusions, own the flaws. We're going to talk to the other side, and we're going to find out what the flaws are in the argument, what the flaws are and what you've done. It's so much easier for us if you just own the flaws up front and address them. I, I, you know, at least that's what I find in my work on the Hill. It may be different uh, at the commission, but um, – Having someone come in and just be honest with you and say, this is why this is a good idea. Let's be honest. This is why this is a bad idea. And we think the good outweighs the bad is very helpful to us as staffers because it cuts through an extra step. We're going to end up going to the other side, getting the counter argument, and coming back to you and asking you to address it anyway. So just own it up front, and, and it's particularly helpful to, to cut through a lot of the, uh, of the nonsense. Um, first, I... I before I, I get to what I really want to say, I, I just want to second David's thing. I, I, whenever someone comes in, I used to work at the antitrust division, so I saw people come in and make presentations all the time. And part of the reason I left the division was I hated those presentations because they were, oh, complete waste of time for the reasons David said. You know, I mean, there's nothing worse than a pseudo-conversation. You know, if they're coming in and then you say, well, what about this? And they just don't answer the question for the reasons David said. Is I mean, I just just put it in writing and mail it to me. I don't, it's, it's really just a waste of time. But what I wanted to do, and, and here, please remember the disclaimer I said, was to do the impossible and disagree with John on this, which is to say, or at least qualify it in the sense that there are some times when big things are at stake when you may not have the data because it's new. And let me give a couple of, ex of big examples, although not particularly recent ones, but dating about, both dating about 30 years ago. Um, when, it, when the old phone company was broken up, there was a lot of evidence of arguably nefarious conduct of one sort or another. Did we know how well the market was going to work if you did undertook what I believe to be still the biggest, the largest single piece of industrial policy ever undertaken by the U.S. government? Um, it wasn't like there was some other galaxy someplace where you could go and say, well, let's see what happens when you take a phone company and break it up and gather some data, or better yet, let's go to 20 different galaxies and, and, and maybe get some data. We could run a regression and figure out what's going to happen. <laughs> you didn't have it. Following that was the introduction of incentive-based regulation or price caps, as they're known in telecom. In that case, again, you had something that was new, something that had a lot of theory behind it, and, but you didn't have it implemented. And, and there were a lot of arguments against it. And one of the lessons that I took away from that is that, is that you've got to be careful in some sense that the demand for data can, in a sense, equates the burden of proof. If you have to come up with the data, you're going to lose. If the regulator has to come up with the data, they're going to lose. You know, I mean, it, ideally, it's like there's going to be this great fountain of data out there. Everybody can look at it and figure out what's going to happen. Um, and, and there are certainly many, many matters that come before us which are like that. But there's sometimes, especially when you talk about something big, on the policy innovation side in particular, where you'd love to have it, you're not going to have it, and so sometimes you just got to take the leap. I, you know, I don't think, I, I don't think that's... Uh a contrary position. Mm -hmm. I hope it is not, because I, I I agree. There are a lot of times in which there is no data to be had because we're not we're, we're not trying a thing, which gets to a yeah. a related element that that uh, we try from time to time uh, here, which is to experiment, that is run a policy experiment and see what the result is in order to get the data when when thing, there's yeah. something new. There, there is a problem with experiments around here. That is. People don't feel they have the time to see an experiment through, um, or they don't want to take the time because, uh, you know, you, got, you get new chairmen, you get new commissioners, 
you get new heads of committees in the House and Senate, and you've got a term. You know, if, if you're a political appointee and you've, you've got two or three years and that's all the time you've got, um, you don't want to wait two or three years to see an experiment play, you know, play out before you get to make your decision. Uh, so there, there is, I'm not going to say there's a reluctance to experiment, but there's a recognition that the time frame for running an experiment and then going through what may be a lengthy rulemaking process, uh, uh, you know, doesn't afford you the time you would want. My, what I often say around here is the experiments are not, come up with experiments in which you can learn something quickly. Yeah. You know, rapid success, rapid failure, it doesn't matter, but, you know, design your experiments so that you know something before the experiment runs its whole course. If what you learn is uh, that it isn't going to work, don't wait for the whole thing to play out and fail. Move on to something else. Uh, but I, I, I agree with the part of the problem is people are proposing things where there is no existing data set. What I was trying to say to Chris is I, I hope we never are in the position where we're ignoring data. I'm not when, saying when that doesn't have, happen. Yeah. I'm just hoping. <laughs> Uh, okay, I have the unfortunate job of keeping us uh, on track, and we're pretty close to time. We did start late. If there is another short answer question, however, I think we could entertain that before we break into the uh, the workshop sessions. I will note that there will be, I suspect, other opportunities. I know uh, members of the commission staff will be joining us from time to time or even all the time. And, David, I think you may come back from time to time for some of the sessions. So there will be other opportunities for questions. Please. Yeah, did you have? Yeah, what's coming? Oh, oh, got Following it. Following your instructions. <laughs> yes, sir. Does anybody want to comment on the unknowable? Uh, we've talked about the 96 Act. I, I was there. I was, I was in industry at the time working for Verizon. The discussion was the phone business. And, and, in, and in less than 10 years, we knew it wasn't the phone business. In fact, some of us knew it then, but the industry thought it was the phone business. And part of regulation is allowing the unknown to happen. Um, so we, we spent a lot of time on regulation. I noticed the 706 section, just a couple of paragraphs, almost as an afterthought in terms of something called advanced telecommunications services. What should be the role of the regulator in allowing the unknown to happen? Okay, we could, we could, I'll yes, a, yes, a, please, succinctly. Thank you. one uh, on that. Would you, I, mean, I think we have to distinguish when we look at this, and I, mean, I think you point me that the multi-year process is that we're talking at very different time scales, uh, namely having uh, a legislative process versus a rulemaking process. Uh, in the sense that I think what helps, uh, and I won't address the legislative process because I think that has very different challenges, and I believe, and you should probably answer that, there's been a recognition of providing frameworks as opposed to technology prescriptions that address a very specific issue as to who gets access to phone numbers or something uh, of that nature. Uh, prescribed goals, methods, and uh, approaches uh, at that time scale, recognizing that you may not be able to uh, revise it uh, either in part or in whole uh, beyond a 20-year time, time horizon. On our level, so say within this building, having much more of a notion of a small self-executing and self-terminating mechanism uh, in the sense that you can you don't know what the future is, how big things are going to be, how well going to work, but if you build in mechanisms so that when things don't quite turn out the way it is, at least you can reduce the unforeseen consequences. And I believe, unlike in the legislative arena, we have the advantage of starting up new things relatively quickly within a, a matter of months. Uh, if we need to, so it is not as where you have to wait for stellar reauthorization or once we ever get to a new communication act uh, in that. So having things that don't linger longer uh, be simply by conditioning them on what's going on might be one way to simply deal with the unknowables uh, in that. But I don't see that as being as big a problem in this building as opposed to uh, on the Hill. On the central thesis of what my bosses have asked us to take a look at. How do you create a legislative framework that recognizes that the technology and communications market has changed drastically from the time that we started this process and the time that a lot of these sections were written 
and foster the kind of innovation that I think everyone in America wants us to continue having in this space. You know, um, America has been the place where technology innovation has happened. My bosses certainly want that to continue happening. And so that's the task that's been put in front of us. How do you square those challenges? A framework that recognizes what's happening in the marketplace but doesn't thwart changes going forward with innovative new technologies and services. So l let me just say a, a word, if I may, addressing your question, Walt, but also going back to Chris's question in, in, in a, slightly, uh, a slightly mechanical way. So 20 or 25 years ago, one of the speakers at this conference, David Reed, was a colleague of mine in the Office of uh, Plans and Policy, as, as it was then known, uh, at, at the FCC. And uh, I think his paper tomorrow really is in the tradition of the work that he did in our office, which is engineering, I would, I would characterize it as sort of engineering economics cost models. So to get to Chris's specific question of, yeah, well, what could we have, what could have convinced John Chambers that it really wasn't the cable companies? Uh, the future was unknowable then, although obviously people had to, uh, had to come up with sort of contingent predictions. But, you know, starting with knowledge available about costs and engineering technologies, it's possible to build models or scenarios or whatever you want to call it to at least evaluate the feasibility and the potential profitability, you know, of, you know, particular types of innovation. It's not a guaranteed, uh, you don't have guaranteed success. And, of course, I think it's fair to say that today we do know a little bit more about gigabit networks than maybe we knew about than we did when you were, you know, looking at sort of, you know, parallel situations 25 years ago, David. But, but still, you know, careful, you know, building of engineering cost models I think can be very, very helpful uh, in, 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 in guiding our expectations and predictions. So that's a very specific type of research technique that I think is relevant to both Chris's question and Walt's. Thank you, John. Thank you, David. Um, I'm afraid that our time for this uh, session has run. Uh, <clears throat> I want to again thank the FCC uh, for hosting us, and I want to. I hope you will join me in thanking our uh, panelists for their insights today. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> we are going to move from here to the workshop sessions, and it looks like Professor Schechter would like to say something. Yeah. <laughs> Across the world. <laughs>